Welcome to Risk Roundup. Technology-driven ability to track human data is driving a fundamental transformation as seen across nations today. The rise in tracking technology has not only made data collection possible, it has also made possible qualification and quantification of data that individuals and entities across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short referred to as NGRUA, never could imagine was possible so far. From measuring simple human bodily measures and procedures such as heart rate, weight, exercise routines, eating habits and patterns, sleeping patterns, to monitoring and managing bank accounts, credit card accounts, to healthcare accounts and retirement accounts, individuals and entities across NGIOA can now quantify, evaluate and understand what matters to them. This is a whole new data-driven world that gives each one of us an ability to take decisions based on data. The data that is generated through human use of tracking technology, there are so many tracking technologies, that is part of smartphones, smart watches, smart appliances, smart cars and more, is on its way to give rise to a whole new personal information economy. So what is this personal information economy? Personal information and personal data, and why is there such a growing debate around it? To discuss this further, I'm delighted and honored to welcome James Felton Keith. James is the founder of Personal Data Project. Welcome, James. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This should be fun. I love talking about personal data. <laughs> yes, yes, great, wonderful. So, James, a growing number of people from across nations use so many different kinds of tracking applications daily. These tracking applications, they automatically without even the knowledge of the consumers or users, share the data generated to not only the manufacturer and service providers, but also to so many different social networks that are used by individuals and entities across nation, nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia. But the fact is that not many people ask the question or even understand that what data am I generating or what kind of tracking devices are generating the data about me, whether and where is the data going and who owns all the data that is being generated? Isn't this a cause of great concern? It, well, I'll say it is the cause of my greatest concern. I feel like um, the greatest uh, political and economic issue of our time is the war over IP or intellectual property and what we deem it to be intellectual property. And, you know, I, I'm even, you know, I'm a big climate change advocate and think that we should do a lot for it. But I think that this issue kind of takes precedence over it because as an engineer, I look at a lot of the problems that we have, whether it's, you know, climate or social issues or economic issues as distribution problems. And one way that we can distribute participation well and distribute equity you know, an equity stake and having a say over what gets to change and what doesn't get to change from a policy standpoint is how we distribute um, you know, actual equity. And I think that personal data, uh, you mentioned it earlier about it, you know, you asked the question, who owns this data that we're all generating? Um, that question has yet to be answered well. And I think if we start to answer it by giving access to ownership and equity to the individual, it invites them into a myriad of decision-making conversations that affect everything else in our known lives and in the known world. So uh, I look at personal data as a tangible yes. representation of our personhood. And so in looking at it that way, it's to say that you should at least own your personhood because your personhood is influencing all the products and services and policies that are built for you. And so I think that's the best place to start, to say that the person owns themselves and they should participate as themselves. And uh, yes, yes, no, that's, yes, yes, no, so that's, that's a very good point. Participate. Yes, yes, that's a very good point you yeah. made because as more individuals and entities across NGI go digital, activities and actions about human lives from across nations, everybody is going online. So the volume of data that we all create actively yes. or passively 
is exploding. So the concern is what happens to the data? What happens to the data, James? What do you think? Well, it's, it's different depending on industry or depending on regulatory sector, right? So I just had an interesting conversation on stage at an event called Money 2020, which is a financial technology conference here in the States and also in Copenhagen. And uh, it'll also be in China in a, in a few months. And in that conversation, I coined personal data as a currency. And I invited a woman on the stage who uh, founded the Personal Data Ecosystem Consortium. She was one of the participants in some seminal papers at the World Economic Forum structured that identified personal data as an asset class. And in doing that, they started to divide personal data by industry. Uh, yeah. Naturally so, because they think about things from a business perspective. but it, in my opinion, and what we talked about on stage is I think that it's, it's wrong to divide them up by industry. I think we should divide them up by regulatory body. So as you pointed to earlier, kind of everything that we do is becoming the Internet of Things. And so we are um, passively or, or you know, actively creating data in a variety of different ways. So not only in the Internet of Things, or what we formally know as the Internet of Things, but also in insurance, in finance, in healthcare, and in geolocation. So those five different groups are regulated differently here in the United States and everywhere else. So when you ask where does the data go, it really depends on what type of entity is curating the data. Yes, yes, no, you made, yes, you made a very important point that data is a currency. That's a very, very, you know, important point. It, it shows the that how valuable this data is and at this point, it is said that the digital world is expanding at a rate of one exabyte per day, and all in each and every one of us, all individuals and entities across NGI are all responsible for this very explosive digital world growth, the growth of the expansion of the digital global age. So both individuals and entities across NGI every day, they all of us, each one of us, we like things, we tweet, we comment, we share, we blog and publish information on the web. So this is, uh, and we are using all kinds of equipments, like all kinds of smartphones, smart watches, smart applications, and computers of all kinds. So do you think, uh, are most individuals even aware what they are sharing by just being online, by simply going online or getting connected to the internet? I, I don't think, well, I think that they're generally aware. I'm sorry, are you getting feedback from my microphone? Should I move this? Uh, the, the, your uh, quality of the voice is a little bit blurred. It, it, okay. How is this? Is this better? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit better. It's a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think my computer is running too many programs at once. But, but to your question, apologies for that. To your question, um, I think that the public is generally aware that their data is being used to make decisions. I don't think that they know the extent to which it is being used, uh, which obviously raises some privacy and safety concerns. But I would say that what they should be more aware of is the, the economic capacity of that data. So usually when we sign up for websites, if we're just talking about websites, for instance, we agree to let those websites use our data in a certain way. But a lot of this data, a lot of the information derived from the data is able to be resold to other parties. And I think there's an article in Advertising Age magazine uh, this week about a company called Group M. They're owned by WPP, which is, I think, the largest uh, advertising holdings company on the planet. And it has a certain kind of data that users agree to let them use but they have created an internal platform where they let other companies inside this large conglomerate also make decisions and leverage the data to, to build products and services and policy. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but establishing boundaries around what our data can be used for might also not be a bad thing because it might, on one hand, sure up the quality of how these businesses are using our data, but it also might you know, protect us from things that we don't want to be 
solicited on or even have uh, revenue to for a variety of reasons. So I think building more robust policy about how the data travels, the transaction of data is is where we can be, you know, more effective as a Yes. as a whole society yes, yes very true and uh, you rightly said that there needs to be some boundaries because the dominant principle of the digital global age it seems to conceal the value of the data that we generate the personal information that we generate and the data we willingly or unwillingly knowingly or unknowingly provide to all these tracking devices that we use every single day by just uh, you know getting connected to the internet so it seems that the value of these data, the people who generate the data or the individuals who generate the data, they are not getting any benefit out of it. So it seems that there is a massive marginalization of individuals and the data that they generate, it, so much personal information and data that they are generating that is benefiting the corporations or the businesses, but the individuals who generate the data they are not benefiting out of that. So isn't this a cause of great concern? Well, yeah, again, th I think this is a, the greatest cause of concern for me. And I think in order to remedy the problem, we have to really engage something that, that has nothing to do with data. Um, so even though we're talking about data as this mechanism, this how we back and forth and how our institutions are using individuals Value. I think we have to do two things. Number one, we have to differentiate what from creation. So normally when we talk about value, the common language is create value. We always have to create value, et cetera. But as we know, because human beings are just internet of things themselves because of the data that we, we have to start acknowledging that they just contribute value. So their value is intrinsic an intrinsic value created, we have to be able to allocate value that is generated from their contributions back to them, which is, in my opinion, why we don't want to thoroughly anonymize any data ever because we want to know what you created. This is of the value pool or value chain or that you contributed to. That's number one. And that's a paradigm shift, that I think, in thinking. But the, the second paradigm shift that we have to have in thinking, which I think we're on the cusp of now, is how we assign ownership. So I'm a capitalist, for instance, and I, I think that capitalism works well if we compare it to its predecessor, which was feudalism. And given the, you know, the time when capitalism really emerged in, say, the 15th and 16th century, we got away from land rights and name rights for people to own things to owning capital being a good way to distribute value and the world grew as a result some great things happened and some bad things have happened as well but all in all more of us are participating in the economy because we have this access to capital we have the ability to own it now formally the ownership process is a difficult you know contractual agreement we need a more loose form way for individuals to now become owners not just where you have to have an institution to own you know, a data set and curate it and do things with it. So if we can distribute ownership more broadly, personal data that is, and what we have the ability to do is distribute value better and invite a lot more people into the normal economy. Now, I think this plays into things in the US and Europe and Asia and Africa and South America, you name it. It is true that 8 billion plus people are contributing to the value pool, but only a few owners are really accessing the exponential growth and productivity. So, so how we distribute ownership is the, the biggest remedy to, I think, all of the other safety and privacy issues that we have around our data. Sure, there are still some details in there to hammer out about privacy and where we draw those boundaries between who's using data and how. But if we start from a place of saying that you are valuable and we want to better distribute you your value, and we make that a unit of measurement, just in how we measure time, which is how we normally pay people, we pay them for their time via wage, then we'll be in a much better place than we are today. And we'll have some room to grow and make some mistakes. Yes. From a policy standpoint.
Yes, no, no, you're right about that. And that ownership is the key. And yeah. because as all of us, I mean, uh, there are, there's a large amount of population across nations that goes on Google, that uses Twitter, that uses Facebook, LinkedIn. And they are basically becoming, yeah. we all are basically becoming a product to all these large corporations. So uh, there is, it seems that especially in European Union, there is now a shift towards more considerable personal data collection yeah. and selective sharing. But we don't see that much in the United States. Where do you see this shift moving? Well, the reason we constructed the personal data project is really to do just that. We want to see legislation more similar to the GDPR in Europe. We want to see the, you know, the government acknowledging people's personal data and housing it in a way that the Indian government does, or at least maybe have private companies be able to offer the ability for individuals to do that. So I met a really great firm uh, a couple of weeks ago called Digi.me. They have a platform where you can build your own data locker. And there's so many other firms like it, you know, personal black box, data coop, vault C, like there, there are bunches of them. The problem is they don't really have a market right now to give you your own database where you can manage all of your information. And it's because people don't know that there's a value proposition. People don't know that they have value first. Like, that's more of a culture. It's a cultural conversation that we need to have, aside from the conversation about privacy. Yes. So the privacy conversation is a business conversation. Yes. But the idea that you have value is something that people usually only hear at their places of faith or worship, or they hear from you know their parents. You know, my mother told me I was good, so I believe it. Yes. You know that sort of thing. So I'm not sure the United States will will use the government to manage people's data in the way that the Indian government does. But I do think that they can help with policy to usher in a new genre of companies that help us all manage our data better, but also help us, you know, proliferate it. Because even though we talk about social data, some of the biggest value blocks of data are wrapped up in like our medical data or our financial data. So when I started the personal data project, it was really after I finished a project at Harvard called the Personal Genome Project that they did a few years back in around 2010, 2011. What they were doing was taking 100,000 genomes to use them to derive all sorts of uh, new remedies to old problems. So I was willing to give them my tissue sample, my blood sample, because they were gonna give me a copy of my genome. And I wanted to know what was in my genome. And at that time, it was very expensive. But yes. that data, they're gonna create new things off of the knowledge that they have through my contribution, right? My DNA is not intellectual property per se, because I'm not consciously building it out for them. It's just a contribution. So it's just intrinsic property. But I should be indemnified at one one hundredth of a percent with everyone else who participated in that group as they derive new solutions to old problems. And this has been going on forever. There's a really great book called The Infinite Cell of Henrietta Lacks. And it's about a woman who died from cervical cancer her cells were the first infinite cell line. And the medical community distributed those cells because if you understand cancer cells, they just grow uncontrollably. And as they grow and were compelled to grow, they distributed those and they created cures to polio, you know, remedies to HIV AIDS, you know, and, and they kind of were the initial study group or study group of cells for um, all of the advancements that we made in understanding the human genome. Yes. So trillions of dollars of industry has been created out of this woman's personal data. And she was not indemnified for any of it. I think that's a problem. Yes, that is a problem. And you gave a really good example about the DNA analysis. These yeah. days, everyone wants to know their you know, heritage or their you know, whatever information they can get from their DNA analysis. So many people are, you know, opting to send their DNA samples and there is no clear guidelines about who owns the data once we get the report. But after that, you know, who else will, you know, have access to those reports? And uh, there are many other, you know, questionable practices and uh, questionable, you know, uh, serious, you know, trends about in the healthcare sector that is a cause of concern when it comes about uh, data and privacy. And there are many people who would say that privacy should always be a trade-off between what one gives and what one gets. But 
when we talk about the data ownership there is no clear guidelines whether we know the data ownership should be defined by the user or consumers or citizens or governments or policy makers who has to who has the authority to define those so that is a question and especially now when we talk about the blurring boundary between personal life and professional life yeah. there it, it creates a lot of you know complex challenges because now a lot of many employers they don't like to you know provide their own uh, equipment like uh, phone especially and they ask their you know employees to use their own device and bring their own device to work now this creates a lot of complexity because how do you balance the private and corporate data protection because when you are using your personal phone at work there is a lot of data about the employers that you know or the corporation or business that you are working that gets onto that and that there is also a lot of personal data that you know gets to the corporation so how do we create this kind of you know boundaries or how can we balance the private and corporate data protection i think that the best thing that we can do from a governmental policy standpoint is set a default so the default should always be in my opinion just like any other property so it starts with whatever the originator is um, so if, if any source of data, whether it's an email or it's a tissue sample or it's a financial transaction, if it starts with me and it's mine, and if I am willing to let you, being another individual or another institution, use it, then then I can opt into that, right? Just just as as you would any sort of other software. I guess when I think about personal data, as it can all be narrowed down to zeros and ones, even the, the DNA, the letter code there can be narrowed down to zeros and ones, it's essentially software at that point. At the point it exists and you can see it, the software. And in my career, I've been selling software for a long time. And the way you sell it is you lease it. Sometimes you have to sell it outright because your customer is, is too big to want to lease something from you. And I think one thing that we can do from a governmental standpoint is to say that you cannot totally give away rights to your personal data. You know, even if it seems advantageous to you at the time, you know, I think that general constitutional protection, whether it's here in the States or in, in India or any other country, right, that they, um, that they set that guideline. And then from there, you know, law and contract law should take place where you're figuring out how you want to divvy up certain sorts of data because I'm with you when I'm inside of corporations and I spent you know the whole of my 15 year career consulting with large corporations about how do we map what individuals have done and track its distribution to see you know how valuable they are and then we try to streamline process enhance effectiveness enhance efficiencies and then we see productivity rise all the while, we're keeping wages the same. Well, we get rid of that job altogether and turn into a contractor job, right? And you made a perfect example about it. sometimes when a contractor comes into a company, they use their own devices, they use their own materials because there's no financial burden on the institution that they're catering to. But in doing that, they're outside of the redistribution of value that happens inside that corporation. But all the while, productivity is growing. So in the way we kind of manage costs from a corporate standpoint, we've locked increasingly over the course of the past 35 to 40 years, everyone out of the value chain and only people who are owners of these institutions really reap the real benefits as their productivity grows. Um, so yeah, let me start with some defaults about, but it has to start with an ideal first to say, okay, data is personhood people have intrinsic value, their contributors, not creators. And then from those big ideas, build out policy and a legal framework where lawyers can interact and, you know, we will make mistakes. Any, you know, any nation state will make mistakes, but um, having adequate legal structure there for people to argue on behalf of, you know, uh, victims and, and, and perpetrators of, uh, you know, ill will, or even unintentional will, right, is, uh, is, a, is a mechanism that we use as, as human beings. So I think we, we can manage this just like every other sort of property. Yes. yes.
Yes. As I was asking that there are some nations that do not allow businesses or companies to keep data more than certain amount of time or a certain amount number of months. So even if the consumer would allow it, they the nation's laws just won't allow that. But we don't see that kind of laws in United States. What what are the what do you think are the US laws? about private information data storage because let's say you go on that dna analysis that we were talking about the genome you know uh, that everybody is trying to get the information about uh, their personal dna analysis and uh, once you get that report should not the you know business who is generating that report be allowed to keep that only for a certain amount of time and then after that it should uh, they have they are you know forced or they are mandated to remove that information about uh, anybody any individual you know the dna analysis we don't see that kind of laws here right um well i'm not i'm not sure that they should have to get rid of it uh because well it depends on what their value proposition is and if they're able to communicate their value proposition to the constituency whose data they have I mean, but, but that's that's my opinion. I'm also of the thought process that I don't think it's a good idea to delete anything ever. I think the biggest problem on the planet is it might sound ridiculous, but it's death because we lose so much that a person is when they when they go away, and so we lose so much knowledge that came from their goings on while they're here. But to your point about other governments requiring institutions to delete data after a certain amount of time, I think that that could be an option for certain sorts of institutions, but the government would have to make a case to that. Uh, and the way I know that like China, for instance, is starting to require you know some institutions to do that. I think they're, they're picky about who they require to do that and who they don't. But um, I just think that that there's a better way to manage all the data that's there because if if I am you know a person and my information is at some healthcare provider or some media company or some financial institution or some insurance institution and they know a lot more about me, they're able to cater to me with products and services that I actually need and sometimes actually want whether I need them or not. And in my opinion, that's a good thing because I need products and services to help my life be you know, better than it was yesterday. So I wouldn't want them to lose that ability. I just want to be able to have the right, like the legal right, to hold them accountable. And not only hold them accountable for adequate or ethical use of my information, but also the right to require remittances from them if I think that I should be indemnified for value that, they're, that they claim to be created. So I do think, you know, institutions, groups of two or more people, they can create value. And again, the way I think about it is individuals just contribute value. So if I contribute my piece to you know, us as a group, for instance, like I'm, I'm learning from you, you're learning from me, we're growing as a result, and we create content uh, as a result from it. If the content is deemed wildly valuable later, I would love to see some of that come back. Right now, I don't have the, the legal right to insist on that. But yeah, so I, I'm not sure that I think deleting information after a while is the best strategy. It only caters to, again, that, that small piece of privacy and safety. It satisfies people somewhat from a safety standpoint, but it's, again, it's not the big objective. I think the big objective, as we reverse engineer everything that's happening in the world as the internet of things, Yes. What we're really doing is seeing that value is pervasive and it's just trading back and forth between all of us. That's the currency piece. And so we want to trap it. I want to trap as much as I need at a time so that I can buy food and shelter and transportation so that I can continue to, you know, be a contributor. Yes, yes, absolutely. And talking about Internet of Things, it, it, it generates so much data, not only about the humans, but also about their homes or about their you know cars or where they go so there's so much data that is being generated so there is this again you know growing debate about uh, it's not just the individual data but also the collective data so 
so who owns the big data because there are there is so much data that is being generated by each and every individual each and every appliance each and every entity it is so much data that is being generated so who owns the big data yeah. i think specific to the big data which and i think this is a great question because I, I in all of my efforts i try to do my best to differentiate big data from personal data so big data is made up of personal data and if it is big ambiguous data um, then I think it's totally fine for an institution to leverage that to create products and services again that we need. It's just after identifying the products and services that we need in the contribution subjects of that big data, which are, you know, as I said, personal data, it is necessary kind of after the fact, after something has been created to figure out who should be indemnified on the personal data front. And that, that's my, my big problem with anonymizing data is I always want to know who my test subjects were. So for instance, business these days, and I remember businesses a while ago and how they interact, you know, you build products that you thought for, you know, either you had a hunch or you had some limited data to assume that people wanted a product that you could create in the future. But the world doesn't work like that anymore with UX, which stands for user experience, or CRM, which stands for Customer Relationship Management, we almost always vet the customer first before we provide them anything. And that's whether it's a, a medical situation or you know, e-commerce situation or insurance or finance, you name it. And in doing that, what we do is we create a hell of a lot more efficiency and making sure that people get what they want. So if I am a contributor to the new design for Coca-Cola's bottle size, but I also have a million peers who participate in that. I'm never saying that we're worth all of the market price, but I am probably worth one one millionth of a percentage point of that market price. And it seems nominal, and it is, but I'm worth that across a wide array of products and services, like this jacket I'm wearing, or the walls that are behind me, this desk, yes. to a point where we'll be able to track all that because the computing power exists. Moore's law has not disappointed us in continuing to double over. And so our computing power in continues to increase where we can track all this stuff and it is not, the costs aren't so extreme that we can't manage it as a society or as a species. So, yeah. Yes, no, that you made a interesting comment that, you know, most of the, I mean, all the big data is basically uh, personal data, individual data that is, you know, okay. in a collective form, it's probably, you know, big data. But there are, I mean, as we go forward with automation, we will see the, you know, cases where, let's say, you know, uh, in my home, you know, the refrigerator uh, sees that, okay, there is no more milk, so I need to order milk. The refrigerator would be able to go online and uh, connect to the store and order, you know, milk by itself and the milk would be delivered, you know, through the delivery services. When the human being, I would not be playing any role in that. It is going to be basically done by those appliances, smart appliances. So then the question becomes, who, the, the, this is not individual personal data. This is an um, equipment that is ordering, the appliance that is ordering that. So that should not be a concern that you know we cannot define that this is a personal data what, what are your thoughts on those kind of complex scenarios that are going to rise well that's a great scenario actually and it in, in that scenario is played out in so many other areas when i think about manufacturing and automation and, and ai and robotics right and the, the general conversation we see it i want to uh a Google update every day to see articles on robotics and the way people are talking about it. But ultimately, even though I'm in business, yeah, I run a few tech companies in my portfolio, I'm ultimately an examiner of culture. And so I want to see how people are talking about a thing. And I, the reason I disagree with the idea that you are, that they're just machines ordering your milk and it's not about you, is because our technologies are not separate from us. You know, the reason we build you know, robotics and AI is their extensions of us. And so the fact that your refrigerator is ordering from, say, Fresh Direct, like I live in Manhattan, 
And yes, my refrigerator could order food from Fresh Direct based on a list we populate. But the fact that it's ordering it for us makes it an extension of us. And so it's doing those things for us. I think that as we build our policy, as we build out our ideals about what technology is doing, we have to first establish philosophically that technology is not other than us. It is an extension of us. And so are all robotics and all automation. So if I take, you know, the old adage used to be, I only have two hands. So I can only do so much in a day, right? I can only order, go and pick up so much milk after, you know, get the kids and check the mail and go to where I got stuff to do. But through automation, through streamlining a process saying, well, I know that you're going to need a certain amount of groceries every week. I'm going to put them in a list in your refrigerator and it's going to order stuff for you, et cetera. What we're essentially doing is just automating the process. So we're taking those proverbial two hands and we're enhancing. We're giving you eight hands. Now, if we translate this over to the workspace, to the manufacturing floors, or even office buildings where people are in the service sector, by the time we get to those 10 hands, we usually remove the individual from the situation. And I think that's fine. But we shouldn't remove their influence on the value of that situation. So what I mean is they should probably still be identified for automating their old process. You know, I used to work for years with old insurance companies, and I would meet um, old, older people who came in and were kind of the second generation after the people who went to World War II. And I was shocked I was going to these office buildings, and it was all women. And I would go, I wasn't used to that. Like, where did all these women come from? And some of the senior people, these EVPs and C-suite executives who were also women would say, well, the very tip of the 60s after the women who held down these jobs while men went to war in the 40s, they hired us as they retired out. And so that's why you see a lot of in the service sector, these women went here. And so what we've done is we've taken things like car catalogs and you know how we Xerox paper from you know yellow sheets for this and pink sheets for that and white sheets for this. And now we call that IT service management. And there's a process. And we built that process based on how we used to differentiate processes with colored paper. And now we're at this point where everything is automated. My point is, specific to your question, your example about the refrigerator is, in automating these processes, we have not taken the humans out. We've just enhanced the number of hands that they're able to use. We've enhanced productivity, we've enhanced value, and we've enhanced the, the amount of money that they can make as a result from these processes. The yes. big problem is when we differentiate the people from the productivity. They are not other than the productivity. Again, it's a distribution cost, it's a distribution problem. We are failing to allocate adequate value back to the people who said, I require milk. I bought the refrigerator to help me do more. Yes. And yes. I need to be indemnified for that. So I think, yes. again, that's the paradigm shift is that we have to understand that we are, we only built these technologies to help us out. What, what I usually tell people not to run on, but what I usually tell people about tech is, I look at tech in three rigid forms. You have methodologies, which are the most pervasive type. You have hardware, and you have software. Everyone's familiar with hardware and software. They think about their iPhone, and that's hardware and software. Are so much more radical and so much more detailed and create so much more value that, that they should consume more of what comes out of those hardware and software. So if you think about the oldest type of tech, I think the oldest method is language. Because we're trying to understand each other. We're transacting personal data, just in trying to understand each other and figure out what words will she understand best. The oldest sort of hardware is, could be hammers or the wheel, either one of those. And the oldest software is fire. You know, so you have things you can't touch, things you can touch, and methods. We match those together. Humans just started using those so that they could get along faster. Given the day. And we're still doing that same thing. And we have to insist on distributing value per those same old things okay. yeah so yes I, I, yeah. I understand your point but see there is also another big complexity this is a digital global age we each nation has you know interconnectedness and interdependencies with all the nations same you know every entity government or industries organization academia we all have so many interconnections and interconnectedness and interdependencies so let's say you know we have heard that european union is coming up with laws that would protect their uh, citizens their 
their privacy and their data they, that law probably will be implemented in the next, in the coming years in couple of years but the question is how do you define who will be protected the, are, are only the citizens going to be protected or are if let's say there are some people who are there uh, on work would they be protected because they won't be citizens but they are just temporary residents so there are all different level of you know residencies that are happening uh, across nations in yeah. united states also we have citizens we have green card holders we have uh, h1 visa holders we have uh, visitors all kinds of you know different categories of people that are residing here in united states in short term i mean temporary or permanent so when we when governments define laws who are they going to target only the citizens or anybody who is within the country at that particular time so how are those kind of differences or how would that be differentiated or how would that be considered by the governments when they are defining policies and the when any single country defines such you know policy for data privacy or you know personal data ownership in silo how effective it would be because unless all the nations come together and define policies when we are talking about such complex and such you know important issues that we are talk addressing personal data ownership unless we do that you know collectively as you know all the nations we are probably not going to be able to make sensible policies so you're you're absolutely right in your last statement in that if we don't think about things collectively we are not going to be able to make um i can't remember the, the word you used but you know adequate policies um but as sovereign nations exist they can only design policy for things that again it's, it's the same way when we think about personal data is origination point. So if I'm designing a policy for the US government, I'm thinking about individuals and institutions as two different types of entities that generate information from here. So I want to protect that information it generates from here. Now you make a good point with the H1 visa, you know, person who's coming here, they're coming from somewhere else and they're generating information here. I still think the individual should always take precedence with I create contribute something to an institution that institution may use it i am leasing that to this institution and so my laws as a nation should protect that institution's ability to use that information and also that individual who came in and their ability to distribute it here and as they go away there is a forever binding connect point there between that individual and the institution that they were previously you know working with inside of this nation and we we've seen that sort of scenario play out you know over the course of the past 500 years with multinational corporations where our interests as you know a sovereign state are great when we interact with other states that these businesses that prop up the livelihoods of people uh, exist so it's it's nothing new i will say i don't think that we will design policy all at the same level at the same time but i do think that what personal data is doing is it's identifying more of the connect points between individuals and institutions and nations and it is what will bring us together and i think it bleeds over into my point that i was trying to make i think i, I did poorly on your your first question is saying that this is a more important issue than even something as big as climate change because the real problem there is we can't all get on the same page about what actions to take. And it's because we don't all have adequate access to participation. So if I don't have an equity stake in whatever your priorities are, I don't care. But if I do, then I can be incentivized to care more. And so the onslaught of personal data and our ability to adequately identify these connect points, which is a very scientific thing, like, you know, the way the scientific method works is something doesn't exist until we can see it. In some sort of physical test but the fact that we can see our information transacting and influencing the value in each other whether we're institutions or individuals yes. it creates this new space for us to start to come together as a society you know and as a species so in building on that 
at the top of next year, actually the personal data project will be no more. So we incubated the personal data project via the Keith Institute. But what we're merging into is a personal data trade association because we're concerned with how this new commodity trades, you know, and what policy looks like behind it. So normally you have trade organizations that want to control policy about their industry, but we think that this asset class is an industry and we need to advocate for the ethical and equitable trade of it. And, and, so, and so that's what we're going to do. We're seeking to bring together really thousands of institutions that we've been talking to to say we want this to exist as a market because it's an overall good for everyone else. You know, the, the idea of having a thousand new participants taking value and adding value from the, from the equation allows them to do things like buy services and products, influence more policy, travel widely, um, and that makes the economy grow, the global economy grow. Yes. So that, yeah, that, 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 that's a very important point you made. And I was thinking about it that the, when you collect, when any entity or any organization collects large amount of data or this big data, it's not just having that raw data that has so much meaning because you still have to analyze it and to make some sense out of that. For example, you know, during the elections, the, there is so much data about the, you know, voters that is available, but it's only yeah. who, whichever party is able to analyze it, you know, to their benefit, to their advantage, to see the trends, to see how, what, you know, uh, works for the voters, what doesn't, what they don't like, what they like, and those kind of, you know, things only if you analyze it. And if you are able to evaluate it and make some sense of it, then you will see the benefit of that, you know, data that you have. But just the raw data doesn't make any sense to, or it is, it is of no value. So there are a lot of people who would say that, yes, this big data is basically, you know, collection of individual data. So, but at the same time, just by looking at the raw data, no value would come come out of that only after you know doing some analysis using some tools to make some you know sense out of the data that data you know shows some value so then again the people would say that uh, this data belongs to the corporations or the entities or the political parties who are you know analyzing the data because they were able to make sense of that so uh, that is that a fair uh, game that you know because they were able to make some sense out of raw data that data belongs to them and not you know to other people yeah i do not think that is ethical i don't think that is that it's fair i do think that they're entitled to some of the value that comes from you know analyzing but when you when you think about data analytics for instance if i give my data which i don't understand to an analytics company an institution that then turns around and uses people and technology to analyze it, right, and then tell me something that I wouldn't have otherwise known, like some sort of insight, then they're still using other individuals and technologies that are extensions of other individuals to analyze that data. So the, the, the kick is, again, when we get down to the granular phase, or the, the granular happening of analyzing this data, we're still using more individuals' data to understand it, right? So if I have a unique skill set for data analytics, because you know I, I can make you know data visualizations. If I code in R and I understand you know how to use you know databases in a certain way, then I am contributing my value to your equation, your initial contribution, and I am participating in the value chain. So while I would say that the institution and the individuals that make up the institution are entitled to some ownership of the insights that are derived from that data, they are not solely entitled to it. And that's why it always has to be sort of, to use older 20th century primitive terms, it's, it's some sort of leasing. So if I am a part of a big data set, like on Facebook, you know, I may not be, I have 5,000 followers, Beyonce has 5 million, right? So she's probably worth a bit more than I am. Her, or at least her contributions are because for whatever reason she's more prolific, you know, and and you know I might grow over time. I'm not sure, but the kick is I am worth something in that equation. I think what we do too often as institutions in saying that we should own things outright is we consume too much of the value chain, and that's what's happening with you know 
stakeholders at the board level and board of directors, when we see productivity rise really well in a corporation, which they have, and all the statistics that the Bureau of Labor Statistics show that productivity is on the rise. But if you look at the gross domestic product or output of this nation, for instance, it, it sits in a certain place. And there are a lot of different factors that play in there. But ensuring that some of that value gets down to the people who initially contributed is, is paramount. Like, it's so important because that's what will prop up the overall growth of, of, uh, of this nation and the rest of the world. So, again, it's just a distribution problem. And by saying that an institution should own all the data that they analyze outright, is that being ethically in it? Yes, but, but they definitely no, have some. Yeah. But they definitely have some. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. sorry about that. Go ahead and finish that. No, I'm just saying they should definitely have some, even if it's the even if it's the majority, they should definitely have some. But we are entitled to some as well. So no, I do not think that they should own it outright. And I think there is adequate ethical arguments and legal arguments. Uh, her old ideas, like leasing, to validate that. Yes, yes, but the, the the whole idea of a digital global age is so that we have an ability of having, you know, collective intelligence. When everyone is online, there is an ability that we will be have we will have uh, all the data available from each and every nation, and we will have the ability to have a collective intelligence to see where the nations are going, what are the big problems that we are facing, and why we are facing those big problems. We will be able to analyze all those complex challenges that we are facing as nations, as you know, a global community, as humanity, as human species. And that is something that we all should be welcoming, that we need to have an ability to have a collective data, collective intelligence for the benefit of solving, you know, for the advantage of solving the big problems, complex problems that we all are facing. But if yeah. that, 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 you know, goes contradictory to the, you know, the debate that we are having about personal data ownership, because we won't be having a collective intelligence without the personal intelligence. All of them are integrated. Whether, whether we are talking about individual data or whether we are talking about collective data or big data, Everything is interconnected, corporate data or, you know, government data or organization data, individual data. Each of these data is interconnected. And without having all those interconnections and having all the data together, we won't have the collective intelligence. So how would we draw the boundaries? How would we differentiate? And if we want to go forward with solving the big problems that we all as nations are facing, then we would need to give some sort of, you know, leverage to this big data, uh, you know, that we are generating and to the collective data so that we can analyze it and we can use it for our benefit that these are the reasons why the poverty exists. These are the reasons why these things happen, why though, you know, uh, corruption is there. So all those kinds of, you know, challenges, we won't be able to see unless we have the data available to us. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the big question in what you, what you just laid out is, do we want to analyze and solve all of these problems? Even while it seems natural to just say, of course we do, right? That's not the case with everyone. I think there are uh, individuals and institutions, whether they're governmental or other sorts of institutions, that have absolute incentive or whatever they believe, they believe to stifle our coming together and solving the problem because they don't see the ability to manage all the problems like population growth or, or, or things like that. So, um, so, so some people are probably going to try to be in the way of analyzing things across national boundaries and corporate boundaries and even individual boundaries because they don't see a clear future for what being able to analyze everything looks like. But you're right, predictive analytics is upon us. You know, kind of the one of the earlier companies that I had success with was a predictive analytics company. And we predict the financial markets. We predict them correctly 
you know, depending on how you organize portfolios, more than 85% of the time. I remember taking that knowledge to big banks. And thought, how do you do this? It's impossible. You can't do this. And essentially, it's no dark secret. What we do is take time series data, and we see that the past has a very loud echo. Now, we're not predicting the future with certainty, but we are leveraging that echo to say this is what is most likely to happen. And even if we're off by a bit, we have a more insightful view of the future than we would have previously. And that's the benefit if you're an investor. But um, what people understand they thought it was some very you know, complex math. It's like, no, this is not a math thing. It's a historical thing because we have collected X amount of data. Now we can make predictions of sorts. And so you're right, we'll be able to do that outside of finance. You know, Uber does it right now in geospatial data. Um, healthcare institutions do it. Insurance institutions do it. Governments do it right now. And even, uh, you know, I, I was at a company called Cambridge Analytica a few last week, actually. They built out Donald Trump's um, data store where he profiled almost every single American, and they confirmed that they have more than 5,000 data points, or what they call PII, personal identifiable information, on nearly every single American. And they use that data to micro-target messages. And it's a total paradigm shift from an operation standpoint from what the Democrats use, which was big data, which was polling, which is ambiguous. And it, it makes me think about uh, a quote, one of my favorite quotes from the ethnographer Margaret Mead that says, what people uh, say, what people do, and what people say they do are three totally different things. If you're running a business or if you're trying to target a message, what you care about is the thing in the middle, what people do. Not what they say, and not what they say they do or did. And polling focuses on the, the former and the latter. What this micro-targeting campaign focused on was what people actually do. So it knew how to target them, where to target them, what to say, and how to trigger those two most important emotions, love and fear to get the sort of votes that they wanted. They upset the world. They didn't even get the popular vote, but they got the ones that mattered in the strategic places that matter. And I can confirm that the people at this company, they're not these radical conservatives that want to contract the economy. They're just selling product uh, that is predictive because they built out the infrastructure and they sold it to a customer, which happened to be this particular campaign. Yes. yes so, these are complex so, challenges. So yes, that, that's a challenge. I mean, to your point, it's very possible to predict things. But I would say that in all of its participants, do not have adequate incentive to stop every war, fix the climate, feed everyone, because they don't see the economy in the same way. And that's why I moved away from building technology. Now, when I first started this personal data project, we built the blockchain because we look at every transaction as a coin. We want to make it like Bitcoin, but for everything. Yes. Then I realized there was no market. And as a business guy, I can't sell something that doesn't have a market. And I realized that there needed to be a rhetorical campaign that addressed th those core ideas that you have value, that your data is a representation of your personhood. Yes. Yes, I think blockchain blockchain would be a, a great you know technology to explore, yeah, uh, for the data ownership because you know once uh, whoever are not entitled to have the data they won't be able to access that, and that technology could be used you know in so many different industries. Talking about healthcare also, that technology is going to provide so many benefits and talk and there are also another issues when we talk about healthcare is that you know the way the data is generated or stored like you know if you go if i go to a doctor doctor you know just uh, gives tells me all the results of my blood work or, my, or any kinds of tests and he yeah. doctor keeps all the data you know with them so if i go to another doctor either they have to do the test again or they have to request the you know results from this doctor and that process takes so much time you go to multiple doctors every time there is you know uh, confusion because you don't own any data you don't have any data with you 
the doctor's offices don't give you any data so this creates such a complex scenario i mean it would be ideal to for me to have some kind of chip that i take with me to any doctor you know i am visiting and just have all the data transferred to that immediately when i'm getting the results so that when i go to our next doctor or you know another hospital or any uh, other city if i move or whatever reason then i have all the data with me but we don't have that the we, the policies the uh, the framework that we have in healthcare is very complex and it is not benefiting the individual at all the you know all the data ownership goes to the hospitals and goes to the doctors and that needs to be a topic of serious discussion but we won't have that much time to get into the detail and also you know the top uh, topic about the financial data when yeah. we use the banks when we use the credit cards all that data who gets you know who owns it who you know is allowed to share that information with others and how much should be shared all those you know complex topics we will need to evaluate in the coming days and we'll have to come you know to a conclusion to what kind of technology to use like blockchain that would provide some sensible you know ownership rights okay. to the privacy and the, to the our personally identified information that we want to keep it you know personal we don't want to share that there is some you know data that we should share for the collective benefit of the human society but there is some you know information and data that we want to keep to ourselves it's nobody else's business so we will right. need to define all those things you are working on this project and you have uh, gone through so much uh, analysis and you have been talking to so many people across you know uh, and uh, across all the different you know industries and uh, probably you know universities everywhere and government so what concerns you most when it comes to personal data ownership today i think what concerns me most is is that no one is is thinking about it so no one has even considered it as an option. I mean, ownership by the individual. I think the only remedy to all of these problems are ensuring that on everything that is disseminated from them. And then we go from there as far as institutions and, and governments go. Um, so that's what concerns me most. What concerns me is sure, because of where we've come from, there's already a faction of uh, business practitioners who think that their institution should own your information. You know, I got into a, a pretty public disagreement with a data brokerage company that wants to collect your data and sell it to people, but it's in their control. I think that that's ethically inept. I mean, we should look at every individual as their own blockchain. And that's the reason I talk about personal data as a currency is because the way I see the future going is who have 8 billion blockchains actively transacting information, whether it's, again, IoT or finance or health or location or insurance. But in doing that, all we can hope to do as product and service creators, as institutions who do that, uh, is add for you some sort of application for insight. So I think in 2011, one of my firms that incubated a crew.com called New Octave, we trademark apps for insight because we thought the way the world was going with predictive analytics was everything was going to be geared around insight and so but we have to make that a broad global legal precedent to say sites on my data for me and i can pay you for the privilege if you require it but your value proposition cannot be to own and house my contribution without me involved at all that more than being legally uh, corrupt, I think it, it's ethically corrupt. And we have to, I think, as we build out more robotics and technology, we have to put human beings first. We just have to. Yeah. Yes, now that, that's a very good point you made. You are heading this personal data project. Would you like to share details about your initiative with our global viewers and listeners? Sure. Uh, so we want to you know, invite everyone to personaldataproject.com. We're also at personaldata.info and personaldata.trade and .nyc in London and, and a bunch of other places. But we want to invite everyone to the Personal Data Project to participate as we expand into a trade organization of thinkers and policy builders. So the 
the project has expanded from being focused on technology, which we, we initially built a platform called the Integrate Platform. This is about integrating people's data via a blockchain. We have since shut that down. There are some great for-profit companies doing a similar thing, and in my opinion, a better way. So we want to prop them up and just ensure that there is adequate policy to see the proliferation of data so that those companies can be relevant. So our, our total effort is to ensure that via this trade association, we have India and China and the EU and the United States and Brazil and South Africa and you name it, um, that they're all on the same page with regards to the idea that people should own their data, that they have intrinsic value, that creation is separate from contributions, and that personal data is a tangible representation of personhood, like those things. Um, but more broadly from a communication standpoint, the biggest thing that we're doing is we've organized personal data week. And it's going to kick off here in New York in April of 2017. And it'll be a week's worth of conferences that explore personal data from a personal standpoint, community standpoint, and a business standpoint. And uh, that the very next month, we'll take it to London. And we seek to be in everywhere else from Shanghai to Mumbai to, um, uh, to we haven't settled on anywhere in South America yet, but we're eyeballing these places. So that we can have this conversation more broadly. Um, yeah, so that's at personaldataweek.com. And um, yeah, I think our biggest effort is to make this a regular part of the conversation so that people can build their governments and their businesses uh, accordingly. Yes, that is very true. That is the whole goal of Risk Roundup, that we want to initiate that conversation so we can start you know evaluating all the risk and rewards that we would have because of this uh, uh, ability to generate data ability to have the collective data but at the same time also the ownership issues who has the ownership and uh, who legally owns it who owns the data and that it needs to be a topic of discussion so thank you james for participating in risk roundup today uh, we appreciate your thoughtful insight on personal data ownership and more importantly for your efforts towards personal data project that you are heading uh, currently. Our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the understanding you provided on the current state of personal data ownership. And even if a single individual or entity can understand the complex challenges facing the ownership understanding of personal data and come up with ideas for privacy and security of the data and prepare themselves for their personal data ownership based on the understanding they received from this discussion we had today. I think this Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service, and we thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Wonderful, James. So digital data ownership is rapidly becoming a cause of concern and a critical security risk. At the heart of this debate is a simple question whether we can control what data any entity or company or business or government collects about us online and what it uses this data for. The tracking devices that we use now know about our individual behavior, what motivates us, what uh, mood we have when, what kind of things we like, what triggers the changes uh, or that we you know, go through in our life, what causes stress, what behavior changes we go through when we are stressed out, when do we travel, where do we travel, how do we travel, who we meet, and who influences us, all this kind of information you know, these uh, tracking devices is able to uh, generate and track and uh, is able to send it to the corporations that are looking to benefit from that. And this is a cause of great concern. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center and Strategic Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA in CGS. That means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. 
tradition becomes our security so if you build a culture of managing risk effectively it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace let's manage the existing and emerging risk together for more information on the risk roundups to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share until next time i'm jayshree pandya host of risk roundup signing off see you next time thank you